We talked last week about the Christmas in the Old Testament series, and what it is doing is giving us some signs for the first coming of Jesus. And in every book of the Old Testament, and how many books are there in the Old Testament? 39. 39. And you remember that how? How many letters are in the word old? How many letters are in the word, te word testament? Nine. Who said seven? How do you spell testament? <laughs> So you have three Old, nine Testament, 39 books in the Old Testament. How many are in the New Testament? Three times seven. <laughs> three times nine, or 27. So we're in these 39 books, and in each of these books is a signpost that help us understand what is going to happen when Jesus comes to Bethlehem that first Christmas. And signposts can be overwhelming if you're not careful. Uh, we have this one. I found this is a new one this week, similar to one we had last week. This is, you're going to need it, signpost. Uh, which, which way do you go? And I think that's a real actual signpost. I like this one too, uh, but I, I'm, I'm telling you, I really need an interpretation uh, for this post. David, what would you think about interpreting this signpost? I would say that's the one I like calling for the little king. We need thanks, Dave. All right. Here's, here's another one. I like this one. The question I have when I see this sign is, do you really want to find that cat? <laughs> and then the last one today is uh, this one. We, we need some punctuation here. If that's where the slow students cross, where do the fast students cross? And so sometimes signs can be helpful. Sometimes they can be a little uh, confusing. But the goal is to look at these signposts. And we started last week in Genesis chapter 3, which gives us a signpost and lays a foundation for all of not just the Old Testament, but the New Testament and on into the biblical future. If you have a biblical worldview, it must start with Genesis 3.15, where God is speaking to the serpent who has tricked the woman into feeding the apple to the man, and he gets all the blame, by the way. And God says to the, uh, to, to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And from that time forward, beginning in the Garden of Eden, there was going to be one who was the seed of the woman, we'll see how important that is today, who is the offspring of the woman who comes to crush the head of the serpent. And from that time forward, the serpent is going to try to eliminate, put to death, execute, distinguish, extinguish the, the offspring of the woman. And we're going to see how important that verse is in today's episodes. Last week we went, went from Genesis up to Ruth, and we said that Ruth was a wonderful picture of Christ, our kinsman redeemer. And Ruth needed Boaz to come and buy her as a bride price and marry her and reestablish the name and the estate of her family, which had come to her through her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law was Naomi. Naomi. Very good. And so to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to be related by blood to the person involved, which Boaz was related to Naomi. Jesus is related to us by his blood. You had to be willing uh, to pay the price, you had to be able to pay the price, and you could not have any other debts. And so again, the picture for us, the signpost is, Jesus doesn't owe anything for his own sin, so when he dies on the cross, he's free to pay the punishment for our sin, because he himself does not owe anybody anything for his sinfulness. So it's a wonderful idea of going through these books of the Old Testament and finding these signposts, and we're going to do some books quickly today and some books slowly today, and we'll have a little time at the end, if the Lord wills, to do some Q&A. And so again, they're putting these up on the website. If you want to go back and review some of the crazy things that we do today, I think you'll be good. First Samuel uh, is, is written by Samuel. What do we know about Samuel? He's the last something. No, he's not, a, he's not the last priest. He, is, he works as a priest, but he's also the last of the judges. And he crowns the first of the kings. And so when you read the Old Testament, the wonky part for most people is when they get into the kingdom periods. And today we're going to try to unpack that a little bit in a way that you can remember and find it uh, helpful. On your handout, we see that Samuel is a type of Christ. And a type, again, is a picture in the Old Testament that is ultimately fulfilled by Jesus in the New Testament. He's a type of Christ uh, in several ways. Uh, First of all, he's, he appoints the first king in the United Kingdom period. And the first king was Saul. And Saul has no heart for God, so he's not a type of Christ. Uh, but Samuel is a type of Christ because he has a miraculous birth. Uh, you remember the story of his mother? Who was Samuel's mother? Hannah, who would go and weep at the tabernacle. And God said, miraculously, you're going to come back here next year and you're going to have a baby. 
Well, Jesus had a miraculous birth. The angel Gabriel showed up to Mary and said, you are going to have a baby. And she said, even though I've never yet been with a man, he, and the angel like Gabriel said, uh, yes. Samuel was the beginning of a new part of God's program because he was the last of the judges and he crowned the first of the kings. When you go from judges to kings, judges lasted 400 years. The United Kingdom period only had one king over all of Israel and there were three kings and they each ruled for 40 years. There was Saul followed by David, followed by King Solomon, and then the kingdom divided. Thirdly, uh, both Samuel and Jesus fulfilled some very specific offices in the Old Testament. And very uniquely, Samuel was also a prophet in addition to being a judge and a priest. Samuel was a priest at the tabernacle, and he was a judge. And Jesus is clearly a prophet. He's called that. In fact, even Islam recognizes Jesus as the greatest prophet. Uh, he is a priest because he offers himself as a sacrifice in the heavenly, in the heavenly temple. And when Christ comes back again, we're not doing the second coming yet, but when Christ comes back again, he will be the judge. He will be the righteous judge, and he will destroy all of his enemies on the earth and institute what we call the kingdom. So that's what we pray for on Sundays when we say, your will be done, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So that's Samuel and 1 Samuel. The more important of Samuel's books from a prophetic perspective is 2 Samuel. Say 2 Samuel. Second Samuel. Why is 2 Samuel so important? Well, it's because in 1 Samuel, Samuel went to appoint a new king. Samuel had appointed Saul, and Saul was a miserable human being. He was selfish. He was egotistical. He only was interested in, what can the people do for me? <clears throat> what can God do for me? And so at a point in time, the Holy Spirit, God's anointing, left Saul. Samuel wept over that. He was grieving over that. And so Samuel is sent by God to go to a new place, Bethlehem, to a home of Jesse, who, by the way, was the grandson of Ruth and Boaz. So Samuel gets to the house. Jesse has eight sons. Seven of them are, are there. And Samuel says, I've got the oil, and I've got the anointing, and I've got the ministry here. I want to name one of your sons as the king. And one by one, by two, by two, by all the way up to seven, they pass by. Not one is qualified in God's eyes. So the Lord speaks to Samuel and said, there's got to be another child here. And so Samuel asked Jesse, do you have anybody else? And Jesse said, well, I got the youngest, but he's out with the sheep. You know, it's like in our house, I had four sons. The youngest got stuck with the garbage. That was his job. Well, in Israel, the youngest got stuck with the sheep. Not an easy job. You had to fight off predators and dangers. And David, and, uh, David was out there doing that. And then in, in uh, second Sam, I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 13, I'm going to read a couple of passages here. It says, And Samuel says to Jesse, Are these all the children? And he said, There are remains yet the youngest, for he is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought David in. Now it says, David was ruddy with beautiful eyes. Ruddy probably means David was a redhead. Seriously, uh, I have a redhead, and she's, she's qualified to be anything. But he was ruddy, he had beautiful eyes, he had handsome appearance, and the Lord said to Samuel, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And then Samuel went home to Ramah. So now David is anointed at the end of 1 Samuel. He's called a man after God's own heart doesn't mean he's perfect. It just means that when he does something wrong, his first response is, how is, going, is this going to affect God's relationship with God's people? So David is, is the king of 2 Samuel, and he takes up the whole book. 1 Samuel is about Samuel and Saul. 2 Samuel is all about old David. And you know the stories where David consolidates the kingdom. He defeats Goliath back in 1 Samuel other tribes are interested in having David be their king, and David is consolidating the rule, uh, but he wants to build for God a temple. God, David's like, why am I, building in, why am I living in this nice palace, and, and God lives in a tent? And so he goes to the Lord, and he says, I want to build you a temple. And uh, the Lord says, hey, that's not going to happen. In fact, go to 2 Samuel chapter 7, and we're going to see how David... 
uh, is given the most incredible promise that will impact not only the rest of the Old and New Testament, but it is a part of our lives today. Because in the Davidic covenant, the promise God makes to David, David God says, I'm not going to let you build a temple. I'm going to let your son Solomon build the temple. Because you have been a warrior, and I don't want a warrior to build the temple. So David's son is Solomon. He will build the temple. But, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12. God speaking to David, When your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your descendant after you who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name. He's going to build the temple. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom. How long? Underline that. David, you're going to have a descendant. He's going to build the temple, and his kingdom was going to last how long? It's going to originate in David, but it's going to go forever. And so in the next passage, next verse, we see this, 2 Samuel 7, 16. David, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever, and your throne shall be established how long? Forever. Now, why is that important? Whew. What's the very first verse of the New Testament that we read at Christmas time say? This is the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus had to be physically related by birth to David in order to qualify to sit on David's throne. Now, David is ruling in about 1000 B.C. So God had to work and orchestrate among the people and among the powers in the world to keep the line of David there until he shows up in about... 6 B.C. to Mary. God sends the angel to Mary. Luke chapter 1, it's part of the Christmas story. Verse 30, the angel said to Mary, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Listen, you'll become pregnant, first of all. You'll give birth to a son. Second of all, you will name him what? Jesus. And Jesus is Joshua or Yeshua, which means what? Salvation. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will what? Never end. Wow. So for a thousand years, God kept the throne of David alive under in incredibly extreme and sometimes miraculous circumstances. So that David could be a type of Christ. David is a type of Christ in, in several ways. First of all, there's more verses written about David than anybody else except Jesus in, in all of the Bible. David is the king by which uh, the standard by which all the other kings are, are measured. And both David and Jesus are related and establish a throne forever. So David is a big guy in the Old Testament. He's important in the Old Testament, but he's important in the New Testament, and he's, and he's important today. Here's how this works. We come to 1 Kings. Say 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Saul, David, Solomon is the next king. And Solomon becomes the king. What do we know about Solomon? He's got great wisdom. Well, how did that work out? You know, it, it, it worked out biblically. <laughs> in, in, in Solomon, before things got boogered up, 1 Kings 3 and verse 4 says this. The king, Solomon, went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices. One night in Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. God said, tell me what I should give you. Now think about that. It's Christmas. I would love for George Hudson to come up here and say, Ed, tell me what I should give you. <laughs> well, how long do you have, George? We got a long list. Cash. Cash. <laughs> My wife is always frustrated because the grandkids want gift cards. <laughs> no, I want you to get you something. Get me a gift card. No. So here, imagine if, if God showed up in your life and said, what would, you like, what would you like from me? Wow. That'd be a pretty amazing request. And Solomon basically says, look, I'm a young schlep, which he was. I've got some tools to work with, but I don't know what I'm doing. And all these people you've given me as, as the Jewish nation are, are bunches of people. What should I ask for? So verse 9, Solomon says, so give your servant, a discerning mind, so that he can make judicial decisions for your people and distinguish right from wrong. That's called wisdom. Now, why did Solomon know to ask for that? I'm not going to have you turn there, but jot in your margin, Proverbs 4, verse 3. 
David is speaking to his son Solomon in Proverbs 4. And he said, here's what you need to do, Solomon. Ask for wisdom and understanding. Solomon got the message. So Solomon is the wisest man on the planet. And in our study, he's, he's a type of Christ. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Jesus is called the very wisdom of God. How does that work? Well, Solomon came from out of nowhere to be the king. Who is, who is Solomon's mother? Bathsheba. So she, Solomon is the product of an adulterous relationship, and yet he's going to be the king and the wisest man ever to be seen on the planet. Now, when you go to the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is trying to explain to these Greeks, we're, we're the Greeks, how incredible it is that a Jewish carpenter dying on a Roman cross could be the payment for their sin and the promise of their eternal life. And the Roman world says, that's idiocy. And Paul says, yeah, yeah, you're probably not, probably right. But in 1 Corinthians 1.30, we, we unpack that. God miraculously allows this Jewish carpenter to go to that Roman cross and sit on the throne of David forever. And by the way, he's coming back again. And the world says, you're stupid if you believe in Jesus. That's not progressive or woke enough. And yet, that's what it is. I didn't write this. I'm just trying to share with you what, what the Scripture says. So Solomon is the wisdom of God, and that's the book of 1 Kings. Now, what's the next book? 2 Kings. And when you see 2 Kings, you should see two kings. Now, why are there two kings? Because of these situations in the nation. David is crowned king. He rules for 40 years. He comes after Saul, who reigned for 40 years, and then Solomon reigned for 40 years. How long was there one king? 120 years. Now there's two kings. How, do we, how did that happen? Well, there, if you want to read the Old Testament and know where you're at, there are three signposts that you need. 931, 722, and 586. Say that for me. Here we go. 931, 722, and 586. Say it again. 931, 722, 586. Now say it without them up there. 931, 722, 586. Tell the person sitting next to you, what are the three dates to understand the Old Testament? Go. Excellent. What happens in 931? After Solomon, there's a split. After 1 Kings, there's two kings. Why are there two kings? Because Solomon had a divided heart. He had a split heart. On one part of his heart, he really loved God and wanted wisdom. On the other part of his heart, he had 900 wives. Well, 300 wives and 600 concubines. How much wisdom could the boy have had? <laughs> you know, Solomon leaves behind a divided kingdom. And when did that happen? 931 B.C. After Solomon died, okay, his prince that would sit on the front throne was a guy named Rehoboam. Rehoboam had no wisdom. And the northern ten tribes says, we're out of here. So ten of the tribes in 931 B.C. said, we're going to have our own nation. And by the way, since there are ten of our tribes, we're going to keep the name Israel. And the two tribes that were left were Judah and Benjamin, and they stayed in the south under the rule of Rehoboam. Then you begin all those kings. 931, you have the north and the south. The north is called Israel. The south is called Judah. How many kings are there in the north of Israel? 19. How many were there in the south? Anybody know? 20. David, you should know this. You've been through this. <laughs> David, what did you have for breakfast? <laughs> Thursday. So it's north, south, Israel, Judah. 19 kings in the north, 20 in the south. Of the 19 kings in the north, how many of them were good kings? Zero. Nice. Thank you, Raymond. In the south, how many of them were good kings? Eight. Okay. So we're gonna, when you read 2 Chronicles, it's all about the eight good kings. But all this is during the kingdom period when we have all these kings and all this sinfulness and all this evil going on in Israel. So Solomon leaves behind a divided kingdom. And one of the kingdoms is Judah. And Judah is trying to preserve the line of Jesus, because how long uh, does Jesus have to sit on the throne of David? Forever. So the line of David has to last forever. And the worst king in the history of Judah 
is a woman. Second Kings. The Davidic line, the Davidic covenant, the Davidic throne is attacked from outside by an evil woman named Athaliah. Say Athaliah. Athaliah. Athaliah was the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel in the north. But she married in to the southern kingdom for peace purposes. At a point in time, all of her sons were killed. So Athaliah decides, this is my big chance to take over down south in Israel. So she has all of her grandsons killed except one. So if you have your Bible, go, to, go with me to 2 Kings, beginning in verse 1. Athaliah ruled from 841 to 835 B.C. She was there for six years. She was the mother of Ahaziah, who was a legitimate king in Judah. She saw that Ahaziah was dead, and she was determined to destroy the entire royal line. Now, that's how things go on in monarchies, don't they? When a new dynasty comes into play, the first thing they do is wipe out the old dynasty. So Jehosheba, I'm not going to make you say these names, the daughter of King Joram and the sister of Ahaziah took Ahaziah's son Joash and sneaked him away from the rest of the royal descendants who were to be executed. What am I supposed to be in? Oh, chap what what ver Oh, 2 Kings 11 verse 1. My bad. Thank you, dear. That's why I bring Gwen along. She, she knows everything worth knowing. So I didn't, have for, I didn't have breakfast. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 2, Jehosheba, the daughter of Joram and the sister of Ahaziah, took Ahaziah's son Joash, sneaked him away from the rest of the royal descendants who were to be executed. She hid him and his nurse in the room where the bed covers were stored. So this little baby was hidden from Athaliah and escaped execution. Why is that a big deal? Because if he dies, the line of David is interrupted. And Jesus can't sit on the throne of David. You, you understand how important this is. So, verse 3, he hid out with his nurse in the Lord's temple for six years while Athaliah was ruling over the land. And while Athaliah was ruling over the land, she was an awful, awful person. She instituted Baal worship child sacrifice, temple prostitution, in the temple of God in the capital of Jerusalem, supposedly under the rule of God. Whew, she's a bad lady. There's good news. Chap 2 Kings chapter 11, verse 12 says this. In the seventh year, now the little baby is seven years old, Jehoiada is the high priest. He's been hiding this child in the temple. He led the king's son out, and he placed on him the crown and the royal insignia, that's the ring. They proclaimed him king and poured olive oil on his head. They clapped their hands and cried, what? Long live the king. We finally have, after seven years of nobody sitting on the throne of David, we got this little guy named Joash. Whew. Now, meanwhile, the palace is just down the hill from the temple. Those of you who've been to Israel, you know where the city of David is, and the palace of the king is right there, and just up, the, just between here and the parking lot is the temple. So guess who hears all this racket going on? Long live the king! Long live the king! Wait a minute, I'm the queen. I'm Athaliah. Something's not right here. So 2 Kings chapter 11 and verse 13, when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people in the house of the Lord. She looked, <clears throat> and behold, the king was standing by the pillar. They would anoint the king at a pillar in the temple. According to the custom, with the captains and the trumpeters beside the king, and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew trumpets, then she tore her clothes and cried, what? Treason! Treason! And she probably was yelling, I'm going to die, because that's what happened. Verse 16, they seized her, as well they should have. And took her into the precincts of the royal palace through the horse's entrance, and there she was executed. Second Kings, the line of David is preserved from outside persecution because of wicked Queen Athaliah. You with me? That's our signpost. Athaliah is removed. 
Now we can go from 1 Kings to 2 Kings to what's next? 1 Chronicles. Chronicles. Now, Chronicles covers the same time period as, sec, as, as, uh, as 2 Kings and Samuel. Okay? Chronicles is just a reiteration of that history. But it's told by a chronicler who is a priest. So his viewpoint is different. So if you find that the Bible repeats itself, you're on the right track. Because Chronicles is clearly a repetition of what's going on in First and Second Samuel and First and Second Kings. The key to First and Second Chronicles is that David's throne is attacked from within. What a mess this is. It sounds a lot like today's politics, doesn't it? By a guy named Jeconiah. Say Jeconiah. Now, who in the world is Jeconiah? He is actually in the line of David. First Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, we find where we, we, we locate old Jeconiah. First Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1 says this. Now, these were the sons of David who were born to him in Hebron. By the way, David had, as far as we can count, 19 sons. I've only had four but 19. But he had a bunch of wives, so he was, he was a busy guy. And they were, the firstborn was Amnon and by Hinnahem. And blah, 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 blah. Now, verse 5. These were born to him in Jerusalem. Shemaiah, Shabab, I love that name. It's like Jim Bob, Shabab. He was, he was from Auburndale. <laughs> and Nathan and Solomon. Underline Nathan and Solomon, because they were both sons born in Jerusalem, and their mom was Bathsheba. Okay. Now, if you skip down through the genealogy, and again, people are important, and that's why we study them a little bit. I would in encourage you to learn all you can about all these people. You know, you might get to heaven and be at the heaven heavenly banquet seated across from Shobab. I'm sure he'll be eating ribs and grits. But you can say, hey, Shobab, what was it like being in the line of David by way of Solomon? Oh, my name's Habakkuk. Ha who? Verse 16, the sons of Jehoiakim were Jeconiah his sons and Zedekiah his son. Now the word Jeconiah, if you have an NIV Bible, is translated with his Babylonian name. Anybody have an NIV? It's Jehoiachin. And that's the only difference. Same guy, Jehoiachin. The NIV uses the Babylonian name, but the Bible Jesus used, uses Jeconiah. That's the Hebrew Bible. So Jeconiah is in the line of David, in the line of Messiah, Qualified to sit on the throne of David, but he's not a good guy. In fact, he's so evil that Jeremiah comes along, okay, right before 586 B.C. Remember, 931, 722, 586 is when the kingdom of Judah is dispersed from the land of Israel. Jeremiah writes right at that time, and he says, is this man, and my Bible says, Coniah, what has happened to his name? He has taken off the Jeh. What is J-E to any Hebrew person? Jehovah. Jeconiah means God appointed. Jeconiah didn't want to be appointed by God. He wanted to be self-appointed. So he comes to be known as Coniah because he's a bad dude. Is this man Coniah a despised and shattered jar? Or is he an undesirable vessel? Why have he and his descendants been hurled out and cast into a land that they had not known. So that's what's going to happen to Jeconiah. And his father is the last of the kings of Judah. His name is Zedekiah from A to Z. Okay. So they're kicked out of the land. What are we going to do? We've got to be in the land. We've got to have the family together. We've got to have the land in place. We've got to have David's throne established so that Jesus can be born on it. Jeremiah. Pulls no punches. He says, oh, land, land, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down childless, a man who will not prosper in his days for, watch, underline this, no man of his descendants will prosper sitting on the throne of David or ruling again in Judah. Aha! Uh -huh. What are we going to do? <clears throat> How are we going to keep the throne of David in place if Jeconiah produces the heirs to the throne of David and Jeremiah says he's not allowed to do it because he's so, so bad. Well, here's how incredibly powerful our God is. The throne of David is attacked from within by this guy, Jeconiah. And so when you come 
to Matthew 1. We're going to turn to the very first page of the New Testament. I've given you this verse. This is the record of the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew traces the genealogy of Jesus okay, in three groups, all the way back to King David and then on to Abraham. And when he does it, he lists all these names. After the deportation to Babylon, there's our boy. Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel. And verse 12 of Matthew 1 says, Shealtiel became the father of who? Zerubbabel is going to be the guy that brings the Jews back from Babylon. After 586 B.C., the Jews have to get back. So Jeconiah is in the line of Jesus. Okay, Verse 13, Zerubbabel was the father of this guy, the father of that guy. You know, This is where you get the he begets. This is where people quit reading. He begat him, and he begat him, and he begat him. But look at the bottom of the he begets. Jeconiah is directly related to who? Jesus. Jesus is a physical descendant of Jeconiah, but nobody can sit on Jeconiah's throne because he was so evil. And Jeremiah said, not going to happen. So how in the world are we going to solve this? Ta-da! Matthew 1, verse 18 to 25, three times. It's so important that in one paragraph it's mentioned three times. What is it? The virgin birth. That solves all our problems. Verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child how? By the Holy Spirit. Skip down to verse 23, fulfilling a prophecy of Isaiah in chapter 7. Behold, the what virgin, and it's not young maiden there, it's virgin, shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Same paragraph, verse 24. The Lord awoke Joseph, or Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he kept her a virgin. Now, why is the virgin birth so important? Because if Jesus were related in Matthew genealogy directly to Jeconiah to David, he was not qualified to sit on the throne of David. So God says, you know what? I'm going to solve this. Virgin birth will work. The virgin birth is one of the five pillars of our faith. I meet, I meet people a lot of times and say, well, it's, just, it's a nice story. But, you know, in the, in the world Jesus lived in, they thought that Mary got pregnant by a Roman soldier. That's what Nazareth was, a, a, a town that housed a, a Roman garrison. There was really no virgin birth. But the virgin birth is essential to keep Jesus from being directly related to Jeconiah. But wait a minute, he's got to be related to David because he has to sit on the throne of David. Well, how does that work? That works pretty cool. We have two genealogies in Jesus' life. The Matthew genealogy is to show why if Jesus was Joseph's son, physically, his, his adopted dad, he could not be king. And the Luke genealogy is to show specifically why Jesus could be king even though he was not Joseph's physical descendant. That's why the virgin birth was necessary. It worked like this. Luke 3 is the genealogy of Jesus in the Luke gospel. It's, it goes in the opposite direction than the Matthew gospel. Verse 23 of Luke 3, it says, When he, Jesus, began his ministry, he himself was about 30 years of age, as being supposed the son of Joseph, the son of Eli, the son of Malaya, the son of Menah, blah, 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 blah. But look at verse 31. The son of Malaya, the son of Mena, the son of Mephatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. You remember Nathan was one of the four sons born in Jerusalem to who? Bathsheba. So what we've got is two genealogies the same way we have today in England. We have Prince William and we have Prince Henry. Prince William will be the king of England. And his descendants are qualified to be the kings and queens of England because they are from the royal line. But, you know, Queen Elizabeth, I mean, uh, Princess Diana had two sons. Harry is not next in line to be the king because he's what's from the regal, regal line. And so Joseph comes from the royal line. Mary comes from the regal line. And it all works out. That may be a little more than you wanted today, but I'm just blown away at how incredibly powerful God is to move the nations and move the kings and establish thrones and unestablished thrones to get Jesus to be the son of David. He has 19 sons. Two of them are Solomon and Nathan. Under Nathan's uh, rule, we're going to come to Mary. Under Solomon's genealogy, we're going to come to Jeconiah. We've seen that. Jeconiah is not allowed to have any descendants rule on the throne. But Jeconiah is directly related to 
Joseph. Meanwhile, Nathan is directly related to Mary. So what does that mean? When Jesus shows up, he gets the rights to the throne. The legal rights come from his father, Joseph, because Joseph adopts him, names him, and takes him as his son. Jesus has the legal right to the throne of David. But physically, he can't be related through Joseph to David, but physically, he's related to, to David through who? Nathan by Mary. Does that make some sense to you? Holler if you need help. I'm, I'm available for lunch. Okay. So that's 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. What were our three dates? 931, 722, and 586. What happened in 931? The kingdom split. 722, the northern ten tribes were so evil, Ahab and Jezebel and that whole ilk, they were destroyed forever. They were kicked out of the land. Have you heard of the lost tribes of Israel? They were lost in 722. They never again regrouped as a nation. But between 722 and 586, we had one nation, Judah, and that was the lineage of David being kept in place by God. But in 586, the Babylonians show up. Why not the Persians? The Persians defeated Israel, well, because the Persians wanted to scatter everybody and never wanted them to regroup. God knew that Israel had to be back in the land. So God says, okay, Persia, by the way, who's Persia today? Iran. The prince of Persia is an evil, 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 demonic being. The Iranians, the Persians, their, their, their ancestors had a different philosophy. Instead of kicking everybody out and scattering them, they said, let's just take all the Hebrews from Jerusalem Let's get all their money, all their children, and let's take them to Babylon. They did it in three groups. You remember the story of Daniel? He was in the first group, then there was a big group, and then the last group was Jeremiah. That, they're there for 70 years. Why was that? For 70 years, the nation of Israel has nobody living in the land. Nobody ruling on the throne of David. Remember that William, what was his name, Malden commercial? What will we do? What will we do? Well, after the 70 years were completed, God says it's now time for the Jews to come back to the land and establish the throne of David because Jesus has to be born in the land. We're going to see in a couple of weeks, we, Jesus has to be born in the city of Bethlehem. Right now, Jesus' descendants are all in Badea, 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 Babylonia. So we come to these last three books. Ezra and Nehemiah are the stories of the Jews getting back from Babylon after 70 years of being in exile in Babylon. Ezra is a priest. And Ezra is, in a sense, a type of Christ because he is an intercessor for the people and he has a great heart to bring the people back. Okay, verse 1 of Ezra 1. This is the decree of Cyrus. Cyrus is the king of Persia. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah... The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and he put it in writing. You've heard of the law of the Medes and the Persians? Once it was in writing, it was a done deal. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. Persia was the largest kingdom on earth ever. He has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So now the Jews who've been exiled for 70 years, are going to come back to the land. Is there any other nation that's been kicked out of their land for 70 years and, re, and repopulated their land? Never happened. Only happens to the Jewish people because God is going to fulfill his promises to David and to Jesus and to us. So verse 3, Cyrus says, Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Who did that? Zerubbabel. You know, back to our genealogy in the first chapter of Matthew. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah became the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel became the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel gathered a work crew, he gathered all the materials, and he led the Jews back on this 650-mile trek up the Tigris and the Euphrates River through Mesopotamia and south into Jerusalem. He began to build a temple. Why was it needed? Because the temple was in rubble. So Zerubbabel looked around and said, we need to rebuild the rubble. And so they started to build the temple. Okay? And as they did, the people weren't 
so excited about the temple, and they were not even worshiping correctly at the temple. So God sends Ezra to be the priest, not to rebuild the temple, that was up, but to rebuild the people. And again, Ezra is a type of Christ in that he is our priest. He, he is the ultimate high priest because he offers not just the sacrifices of animals, but Jesus offers himself. So Ezra has two parts to it. Ezra 1 through 6 is about Zerubbabel, and Ezra 7 through 10 is about Ezra restoring the people. Now they have a temple and they have a people. What do they need to be a city and functioning in the ancient world? A wall. In fact, the wall had been knocked down by the Babylonians in 586. And for all these years, how high was the wall? It was about knee high. So God had to raise up Nehemiah. <laughs> and the book of Nehemiah is all about building the what? The wall. So the Jews could be secure, the palace could be occupied, Mary and Joseph could come and give birth to baby Jesus, and he could sit on the throne of David, which is reestablished during the time of Nehemiah. Nehemiah is a wonderful picture of Jesus, if you think about it. Both Nehemiah and Jesus gave up a high position to do a lowly task. Nehemiah was a cupbearer. He was the, one of the key leaders in all of Persia. Jesus was in the heavenlies with his father. He gave all that up to come to earth and be a human baby. Nehemiah uh, was tasked with a specific mission, and he undertook it, and he did it. Nehemiah built the wall of Jerusalem in 52 days. You couldn't get, that, you couldn't get the permitting done today for that. We've been trying to get the, <laughs> the Polk Parkway done for the last four years. We're still stuck. We drove there yesterday, orange cone after orange cone. Nehemiah had a job to do, and Jesus had a job to do, and he did it. Nehemiah was a man who prayed. Every chapter in Nehemiah's book has prayer. When he's asked, what do we need to do? Nehemiah said, first thing I did was pray. When he got to Jerusalem, he gathered the leaders together. He said, first thing we're going to do is we're going to pray and fast for three days. Jesus prayed. He prayed and he fasted. And in Nehemiah, the timetable for Jesus' first coming actually begins. We're going to do that next week in the book of Daniel. When Nehemiah gets sent back to Jerusalem to build the wall, because it was only how high? Okay. That was the beginning of a timetable in Daniel chapter 9, when Daniel said, you know what, from the time of the, the command to rebuild the wall in Nehemiah's day, there's going to be 483 years to the day until Jesus comes. Wow. Don't miss that. So here's Nehemiah. Verse 1, it came about in the month of Nisan, that's March, the 20th year of Artaxerxes, that wine was before me, and I took the wine and gave it to the king because the wine bearer had to taste the wine so that it wasn't poisoned and the king knew it was safe to drink. Now, I had, been sad, I had not been sad in his presence. In, in the ancient days, if you were sad in the presence of the king, they could have you executed because the king wanted happy, 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 happy. Nehemiah said, I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tombs, lies desolate and its gates have been consumed by fire? And the king said to me, what would you request? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah to, to the city of my father's tombs that I may rebuild it. Wow. And so the, the decree happens not only allowing the wall to be built and the city to be established, but allowing the timetable to take place. You remember when Jesus kept saying, my hour has not yet come? My hour has not yet come. We know exactly when the hour was based on this decree. Wow. And then he says on Palm Sunday, if you had only known this day, if you had only known this day, this day which was set in motion by this decree, of King Artaxerxes to Nehemiah to go and rebuild the city. We know from that day until the coming of Jesus was going to be exactly 483 years. I just love the way God says, you know what? I'm done with the Babylonians. I'm done with the Persians. I'll put Israel here. And then he does the Greeks and the Romans. And he just, you know, God is not up in heaven worried about, are we going to get this right? He's saying, I'm orchestrating all these events so Jesus had come at the right place to the right city, and sit on the right throne and rule forever. I think God must be a Presbyterian. <laughs> Esther's the last book, and just as we ended up 
with a female last time. I want to end up with her because she's special. Most of the Jews did not come back with Zerubbabel to rebuild the rubble. Most of the Jews did not come back with Ezra to worship in the temple. Most of the Jews did not come back with Nehemiah to build the wall. Most of the Jews stayed in Persia. They've been there 70 years. By now they've been there 100 years. Their children spoke Persian. They did well in business. They were an asset to the country of Persia. And all of a sudden, there's a really bad guy who shows up in Persia, and he realizes how blessed the Jews are. Sound familiar? And he goes to the king, whose name is Xerxes, and he says, Hey, man. By the way, the guy's name was Hey, man. <laughs> hey, man goes to the king and said, We got to do something about all these Jews. They don't bow down and worship you. So Haman was actually able to get a, a decree from the Medes and the Persians that any Jew who did not bow down and worship the king was going to be killed. And there was a date put on it. Now Esther shows up. Esther is a nice Jewish goyal living in a place like Poesia. Esther is a Jewess. And she realizes her people are in trouble. She's, she's an orphan. She has nothing going on in the earthly realm. But she's a child of the king of Israel. And so she has an uncle, Mordecai. And by the way, I, I love that name, Mordecai. In my lineage, on the Welsh side of my grandmother's family, there's an there's a uncle, Mordecai. Someday I'm, I hope to meet him in heaven. But Mordecai realizes that the Jews are going to be exterminated. Why is it Satan always wants to exterminate the Jews? Because if he can get rid of the Jews, who won't be born? Jesus. It's all about the spiritual dynamic. Esther 4, verse 13, you may have read this passage. It's wonderful. Mordecai told them to reply to Esther. Go to, Esther's been taken into the king's harem. She's one of the king's wives. Do not imagine that you in the king's palace can escape any more than all us Jews. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. What a great faith. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows? Don't you love this? whether you have not attained royalty for such a time as this. We need to be praying for the program of God, for our nation, for our state, for our city, that God raises up good and godly people for such a time as this. This is a critical time, as it was in the day of Esther. She puts herself in between the king and the people of Israel as an advocate. Oh, she's a type of Christ. First John 2 verse 1 says, we have an advocate with the Father. When Satan goes to the Father and says, Ed Diaz deserves to die, he sinned. <clears throat> Jesus steps in and says, excuse me, Your Honor, I'm his defense attorney. I've already died for him. I need that advocate. You need that advocate. We need that advocate. Esther was an advocate and she delivered the Jewish nation. One more time, Satan's plot to destroy the Jews is foiled the Jews stay in Jerusalem, and the lineage of Jesus goes through from about 400 B.C. up until about 5 B.C. when he's born. They trace the genealogy, and we'll see next week when Jesus is born, it's to the right parents, in the right city, on the right day, on the right time, so that he can go to the cross and his hour can be fulfilled. So, in the midst of all this craziness, remember, God is in control. And he's so much in control that he arranged all of the countries in the world and rearranged them at all the right times so that Jesus could come to Jerusalem 2,000 years ago and die for your sins. We should never get over that. The wonder of Christmas is not a guy in a red suit. The wonder of Christmas is that God manipulates and controls the nations of the world in order to get his work done. And his kingdom will come and it will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our Father, we love you. We are blown away by the way you point to the first coming of Christ. There is Christmas all through the Old Testament, whether it was through Zerubbabel or Ezra or David or Solomon or, uh, or Nehemiah or this wonderful gal, Esther, who is willing and brave enough to put herself on the line and risk her life to save people. We ask for that boldness, that we would risk our lives as we go into the world with a message of life-saving grace that comes from you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.